Very much. This is the last segment for today or at this time. Uh, I'll probably come back later on today. But that's my own. I'm thinking out loud. I apologize. Let's get back to the lesson. This is Jeremiah with New Covenant. We're bouncing around Romans just a little bit, and we're, we're looking at some terminology. I just left off on uh, predestined, as Paul mentions this in the chapter we just looked at, uh, pertaining to God has called you from before time and so forth. And, and uh, we mentioned, of course, that it's a very dangerous term because some people can look at some scriptures and think that you, you have been predetermined uh, from the jump street. And, and that's not biblical at all. We, we just looked at uh, a, a Judas. The Bible says that Judas had an office. And he shrunk back to destruction, which is what Paul says. The Bible says that the children of Israel, when they left Egypt with Moses, they were basically saved. They were sprinkled with the blood on their door, and that means basically you're saved. But the Bible basically says they shrank back to destruction. And then God said, he said, I swore in my wrath, I swore that they would not enter into my rest. Which means they were headed for the rest. They, 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 were, they, were, they were in like flint. They, they were on their way. Paul also uses the word shipwrecked. What does shipwreck mean? The master said, you have lost your brother. John says, what did John say? They left us. What does that mean? That means they were here, then they're gone. Not everybody who's hanging around is hanging around. Uh, Paul said false brethren. Was that Galatians? False brethren. There are fake people around here. Jude said, there's a man in the church who's, who, who's abusing the grace of God. Who came to church there, and he wanted to party, uh, bring alcohol into the church and party with the, with, the, with the Christian people. And the Bible says that he was hanging around, but he obviously wasn't saved. He was hanging around, wasn't he? That's what Jude said. He snuck in. This is Jeremiah with New Covenant. We're, we're rejoicing in the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to get into uh, Exceed Nike right now. That's 68 on my list here because I have everything numbered here for Romans and Corinthians as we breeze right through these two books, okay? Uh, I think I, I, I went as far as Corinthians 7, which is marriage marriage. Uh, counseling from Paul. Uh, that's Corinthians 7. Let's go to Exceed Nike. This is Jeremiah with New Covenant. We greet you in the only name given. We're having a, a, a fun time, a wonderful time going through uh, a little bit of Romans and looking at some words and terms. Now 68 means Exceed Nike. Uh, that, that goes through a couple of Paul's writings, which of course is a fight, a good fight, a winning fight to Timothy, who's not necessarily fighting a good fight. <laughs> He's having some problems. Uh, flee youthful lusts and so forth, which are often common amongst Christian people, especially if they're young. Let's get back to the lesson germane here, which is a go beyond a conqueror. You go beyond a conqueror when you put every proper thought in your mind. One of the points that, that Paul is mentioning in the book of Romans here is that you, you're more than a conqueror when you realize that you're justified by faith and not by the law. That makes you a, a winner because somebody could come knock on your door and tell you that you're not justified by faith. And if you believe that, that makes you a loser. So a winner is going to believe in what Paul just said at the beginning of, of, of chapter 5, now being justified by confidence in Jesus Christ not by you obeying the law. So that's, that's a conqueror because a lot of people are conquered by this ideology of heresy, damnable heresy. They, are, they lose the war of ideas. They lose. 
They're subverted. They're no longer straight anymore. They've been deceived. And a Nike is a winner. That's what it means. And it means that you, that means that every, everything that came to you that was that, that, that was attacking you, you knocked it out of the way. That makes you a champion. Now we have loved ones here, where Paul's going to talk about loved ones here. And uh, uh, where is that? Of course, that's in that's in uh, Corinthians, of course, uh, sixteen and so forth. And uh, let's move on to Nike uh, or ashamed. Paul talks about there's only two ways to think: to think as a champion or to think as someone who is ashamed of the truth. For whatever reason. Some people are ashamed of the truth because the truth makes you take a poor posture or a person who is going to embrace basically poverty. So you can be ashamed of the fact that God wants you to look poor and you're not going to have it. So you reject the gospel. That makes you a loser. A winner accepts all the conditions of the master. He's actually master. One of the conditions is, has not God chosen the poor, rich in faith? And the gospel is preached to the poor. Luke chapter 6, blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Woe to you that are rich. You had your party. Uh, Isaac was born as a child of promise from, from Abraham, and he's a child of promise, isn't he? That's exactly what he is. The promise was to Abraham and his seed, and he was the first one born of Abraham. So the first promise, the first child who, who, who is going to, to have clear confidence in the... In, in the uh, in the uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, way ahead of time, uh, far ahead of time, is Isaac. Abraham understood that there had to be a sacrifice for humans to live. So he offered his son as a sacrifice. God told him. And God said, stop. No, 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 no. Uh, no, no. I, I have my own son that's going to sacrifice, not yours. Go get a lamb uh, out, of, out of the bushes. That's who's going to pay for your errors and have you go to eternity. So you have confidence in that, Abraham. And, and then his son had confidence in the same concept. So he is the first child of the promise. And mercy uh, becomes a big point here, of course, in every Bible book, of course. Uh, that you don't get what you deserve. And it's, and it's appointed to you uh, before you were born that you were going to receive uh, goodness that you, that you don't deserve. And that's based upon your errors. The word grace basically means you get good in general, like in the future. Mercy is basically the same thing as grace. They're interchangeable terms. However, they, they, they generally have a slight difference in, in these synonyms, you might say. Uh, one of them is your past is, is shining on, bro. Forget about it. Forget about it. I'm going to forget about it. That's mercy, even though you did something wrong. You offended. Especially God, of course. Then, of course, we have uh, a mercy, which, I, which, which is you, you're going to get good things, basically, in the future. That, that's what that generally means. So you need basically both of these concepts to be active in your life for you to be, oh, I don't know, saved and happy and all the good stuff. You need both of them. You need God to forget about the things you've done in the past and, and plan to have good for you. And then you need him to bring you good things that you don't deserve.
It's kind of like the past and the future tied together. However, they're, they're, they're basically interchangeable. Especially grace. Grace is the one that's probably the most interchangeable. Because I can say that I gave you something that you don't deserve, and that's mercy. And I can say I gave you something good in the future, which is heaven. Mercy also leans more towards also being compassionate and caring in general. Charity, giving. You, you might find a lazy person who, who, who needs to eat, and you go ahead and feed him anyway. A lazy person doesn't deserve to be fed, per se, do they? No. But you go ahead and feed him anyway. I used to help take care of some people who had mental problems in, in, in the state of California and in institutions, and the, the people were basically lazy. They could have trained those people how to work, a lot of those people that live there. They could have trained them to clean up. They didn't sit around and just uh, giggle and, and, uh, and play with toys or something. But for the sake of them not having accidents and all that and, and, and knowing where they are, because they're having mental issues, um, uh, sometimes congenital and sometimes not congenital, um, I help take care of them and clean up after them a little bit. As a janitor. And I saw they, they might be a little lazy or something, but that's okay. We bless people who have problems, even though they may not be doing good. And that's what the word mercy means at the end of Matthew chapter 5. Mercy is a big term. It's broad. That's it for this uh, uh, row. I'm, I'm done with the first row here. Uh, we only have another couple boards to go, and, and I'll, I'll finish this before uh, the end of the month. I, I want to finish Corinthians and Romans, and I want to finish... Uh, um, Matthew and so forth. We won't go that right now. We're just about two-thirds done with Matthew right now, and it's been a wonderful experience going uh, concept by concept. I am not going to give too many overviews or cursory looks at uh, the Gospels. When it comes to the red letters, we usually get right down to business. For Paul, we, we, we dance around a little bit. It doesn't mean that Paul doesn't have the same basic serious authority that the master does because the master is the one who taught him. It's just that when it comes to those red letters, we are really going to focus. I'll, I'll go easy on Mark uh, because a lot of Mark is the same thing as Matthew, so that makes Mark easy. Luke is not that easy. Um, it, it's a lot of work. A lot of work in Luke and a lot of work in John. I think Luke is, is a little more difficult than John, but uh, We'll see what I do with that. And that's going to take uh, all of September. Easy. Those two books. And I'll tie in some of the small books of Paul so that by the time the holiday season comes, we basically covered the entire New Testament, and some of them in overviews and some of them verbatim and so forth. I have different approaches to teaching those and reading, okay? That's it. And, of course, uh, we're, already on, um, we're already on Proverbs Proverbs chapter 7 now, I think. I guess. Let me look at my board here. Yeah, we're on Proverbs 7 here. Um, that's where we go next. Okay. A wonderful time here at New Covenant where we have Bibles everywhere and, and, and we have worship songs. And we I'm working, I'll, I'll share this with you right now. I have some worship songs I'm working on right now. Okay. Um, and, and they're, they're, they're my songs, and, uh, and I write songs, and uh, they may be kind of simple Simon, row, row, row your boat songs, but you know, they're my songs, so, so to speak, or the Lord's songs, and, and they're original, and they are um, what, what they used to call corn. Uh, I have a lot of corn in my music, and corn means it's just standard procedures on chords. But I'm going to give you some a lot of corn, and, and it's going to have color to it. I don't mind a lot of corn. 
Uh, I think next year or the holiday time, when, when holidays come, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to challenge my ear uh, and be more like my earth father who, who, had a, who had a much better ear with music than I did. Um, he used to hang out down the street with the best, one of the best guitarists of all time, Wes Montgomery. That was his best friend, right down the street here. My earth father's best friend was probably Wes Montgomery. Wes Montgomery is one of the most talented guitarists who ever lived. He's an amazing musician. We're not worshiping Wes Montgomery. It's just a, he, was, he was very talented. He used to show up by here to orchestra sessions with no sheet music, and they would ask him, basically, you know, they, they probably asked him, everybody has sheet music here, you know, so they can keep track. And, and, and I, evidently, he didn't, he said, I already know what I'm going to do. <clears throat> and he basically said, I already know what everybody else is doing. Kind of like Mozart, you know, just, uh, I, don't, I don't need to do anything right now. I Just start playing the music, and I know where you are, I know where everybody is, and I basically know what I'm going to do. And, those are the, and, and I'm not even close to that kind of talent. <laughs> no way. Uh, I have a lot of roll, roll, roll your boat music, but, uh, you know, roll, roll, roll your boat music is not that bad. You know, it, it, there's a time for it. And, and, and I plan on exceeding that um, uh, that corn music style here. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge myself. And I'm going to have to get out lots of chords and stuff. And, and it, it's going to be a, a wonderful journey. As I share with you the music aspect of this ministry, which is a big aspect. I'm getting a lot more hits on the music in this ministry than I am in the Bible study, but that's because pe people are don't have a good attention span anymore. The attention span has gotten worse. People's hearts are growing cold. It affects the attention span and so forth. And and uh, but you know we're going to keep plugging away and hoping that people will enter into discipleship. That they will kneel and 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 allow the Lord to build a disciple, to build a servant, with you know with lots of discipline and so forth. Okay. They can be a workman, but the music I'm very happy with it, um, even though it's corn. <laughs> you know, even though it's uh, you know uh, the gentleman around the corner here, Mr. Porter, who's one of the most famous. Musicians in the history of the world. Uh, his music was famous in England in the early 20th century there, and uh, it was famous everywhere. And he used to right around the corner, uh, not too far from, not around the corner, but he's not too, he wasn't too far from here. They have his picture downtown here in Marion, Indiana, but uh, uh, Jimmy Dean's from this town too. Uh, but uh, that guy was really an amazing. You know, he kept track of uh, time, uh, you know, really good and, you know, in a really proficient manner. And uh, I have some of that skill, but I, I, I doubt if it's even near anything uh, what this Mr. Porter and, and, you know, these George Gershwin types and stuff. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, you never know where you'll end up. You know, if the Lord, does, if the Lord tarries, and doesn't come back here soon. That's what that means. Uh, we're going to uh, probably get, you know, close to some of these uh, proficient musicians. I'm, I'm going to have to concentrate more. A lot of these guys had a really good instant concentration ability where they could keep track of notes, you know, and they had notes in their mind where they could extrapolate. We used to listen to Jimi Hendrix when we were young and so forth. And, and, and some of these musicians, in their mind, they can keep track of notes precisely, and they can improvise in their mind. Like they'll start singing, and then they'll say, well, I want to I, I wanna put a 16th note to an 8th note, and then a rest. You know, or something like that. 
and then they'll have a 16th note with an eighth rest. And then that gets a little more complicated when you go into thirds. And, and, and in their mind, they have the ability to break up the entire measure in various ways. Also, to know where the pitch is. And what makes it even more complicated is to have in your mind how that's going to sound before time. If I play an E flat with a flat nine and I throw in, a, 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 I don't know, an augmented five or something, I know how it's going to sound when I play that and resolve it to a more conventional chord such as C major. People who learn how to do that, these are the advanced people. They know the people who can, who can play a chord and can imagine uh, playing a note that's not normally in that chord. It's not normally played in that chord. If you play D minor, people don't usually start on a B flat. You know, that's not basic standard procedure. It's jazzy. It's out there. You know, it's, it's experimentation. It's, 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 it's spreading. And, you know, you know the, 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 the normal procedures of a D minor chord or something like that. And, uh, and when you can do that, you can write some music that's much more original, and it's not corn. You know, so that was one song I was playing the other day, a D major chord from a famous composer. And, and he, he started the song out playing like B flat. Then going to another chord that's not necessarily in commonly used when you play B flat. And when you know how to do that, and then build on that, and then come back to some common notes, see, then that's what makes you different and original, and and uh, it makes the music that many people might consider more beautiful, maybe, you know, as opposed to just playing la 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 la. La 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 la, you know, but which is my style of music. That's I'm Frederick Bergmuller all over. Arabesque. Okay, Jeremiah, you're done. Yes, we're done. I want to just ponder a little music with you as we are happy about the hymns. We have about a thousand hits on the hymns right now. I would say about a thousand, and that's not bad for for somebody who's not very popular. And advertising? I don't advertise very much at all, right? I don't have any advertising. And a lot of my friends and relatives, they're not really advertising my music. Uh, they're just living their lives. Uh, I could probably use a little help with them advertising, uh, you know, so that we could spread, you know, the music and the word and, and the hymns themselves. And let me talk about the hymns for a minute. The most important thing in, 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 in American history is probably... American hymns. I would say the number one thing in America is American hymns. The most valuable thing why we, why we sing God Bless America is because of hymnals. That's what really made America great. Obviously Bible study uh, does it too. We're not, we're not going to... But you, you have Bible study with hymns. We have that song, Jesus Paid It All. We just talked about that right here. Around the corner, the Catholics say, you can pay for things. That's why they call it penance. They call it absolution. They have these terms that refer to your activities as to you being accepted. Absolution. Penance. These terms refer to you establishing some sort of ground with God. So that when you go to the throne of grace, it's no longer the throne of grace anymore. It's the throne of grace and my works. It's the throne of my achievements in my body uh, doing right things. That's why they have those terms they have around the corner over there. 
And that's why it's called a damnable heresy, because we just read from Paul that you're justified by faith and not by things you do. And it's simple grammar. It doesn't require, uh, you know, uh, Einstein extrapolations uh, in mathematics in the imaginary outer space. You, you don't need to have all these qualities to figure that out. Do you? No. It's by unmeritable favor you are saved by putting confidence in the gospel. Now, I, I explain that and delineate that here for you, but that's the bottom line. And they say that that's not true. And sometimes they might hear you say that and say, we believe that too. Which means they're lying. They know that you must pay penance. Uh, they, they, they have a, a docudrama here, I might watch that tonight, where, where, where a man kneels before another man and kisses his feet or something, which is really sick. And, 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 and then, and these, are, these are Catholics portrayed with, uh, uh, um, um, with, the, with the, uh, the conquistadores and so forth. And, uh, and what happens is, in the movie, it's a docudrama, which means it's based upon reality and so forth. Uh, probably, there's some, probably some twists to, to, twist to it in a novel fashion, but uh, the lady says, I'm going to go buy some candles and God will, will give me a husband. This is why this is all damnable heresies. All of these, all these groups around here. Because it's performance-based relationship with God. And you can't have performance-based relationship with God. That's why it's called the throne of grace. There's only one way you can approach God, and that's through the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he performed, and you enter into his finished work. You, you, you don't have your own work. The only work you have is kneeling before Jesus Christ in humiliation, and, and, and that's not a work. We call that a yield. Yielding is not a work, per se. Yielding is, I'm confident that loving God is what I want to do. That's what that is. When you kneel before the Lord, you're, most people are, 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 are seeking the love, comfort of God. That's part of what they're doing. They want to be forgiven for their errors, and they know that God can do that through the gospel. So they're wise enough to understand that I want my errors removed. So I'm going to comply with the requirements such as, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I don't want to die in my sins, so I better believe that he is he. Simple grammar. Jeremiah is done for the day. We have a lot of teaching here. Uh, I don't think we're going to come back in now. Today I'll, I'll share with you about what I'm going to do. But Jeremiah, your Bible teacher and friend here, we're just rejoicing in a lot of vocabulary. We have three more lines of vocabulary here. And... Uh, I thought we would get through this quicker, but we didn't. As time goes on, I will adjust my, my calendar. If, if this keeps up, I'm going to have to forget about Babylonian ideologies until the holiday time to get started on it. I won't finish it until next year. That, that is a, a comprehensive look at a lot of higher education, Aristotle, four-syllable word stuff. Okay? From your local library and so forth. I'm going to... I'm going, to, I'm going to tackle and attack uh, the devil, so to speak, pertaining to all of these uh, uh, sciences in school and so forth, and to expose them as baloney. They're not scientific at all. There, there is some science in some of these uh, Babylonian, I'm going to lie to you a thousand ways a Sunday. You, you, have, to, you have to insert some truth. Uh, Hitler said that he was, he was a barbarian, and, and I behave as a barbarian. Which means barbarians murder, steal, attack, torture. That's what barbarians do. Hitler admitted to being one. But he also said something interesting in terms of he has to basically mix some truth into being a barbarian. 
barbarians need an excuse to be barbarians such as other people are inferior to you and Hitler did the same thing that Muhammad did they murdered their own people who disagreed with them the one of the first things Hitler did was he murdered the science teachers who taught that everyone's blood is the same because everyone's blood is the same he murdered them I, I, there's a good docudrama on that uh, available made in the United States the man who started the movie started the movie who was murdered is the same man who played the Wizard of Oz he played the wizard in this movie he played the person who was murdered by Hitler he was arrested and murdered he was a professor at the, at, at the university and the Hitler youth reported him as teaching that all people are the same and that was his rear end uh, unfortunately then Hitler tried to murder his family but they got away these are brutal people and if you even begin to contradict them in any way you'll, you'll find yourself hurting for certain I don't have that docudrama I have a lot, a lot of docudramas um, and sometimes you have to take these docudramas with a grain of salt or something you, you, you need to be open to cleaning it up revisionist history is very popular this is Jeremiah we're done we're rejoicing together with you and these 30 minute segments I said I was going 15 minutes but we've been going 30 plus because there's just so much deep stuff with Paul and and the master I'll, I'll try to get back to 15 minutes I don't like 30 minute lessons that much but here, we'll let that go. Maranatha, we're enjoying fallen Romans and vocabulary and context and everything. Maranatha.